Bienvenidos a la segunda sesión de seminarios del día de hoy. Pues estamos aquí eh, para este, escuchar un, a trabajos de conservación y aves migratorias. Y esto. Pero antes tengo que darles una información muy, muy general y básica. Lo primero es, si estuvieran en el seminario de la mañana, ya lo saben, en caso de emergencia, que es una alarma que pase cualquier imprevisto, tenemos que desocupar el auditorio de una forma organizada. Y como hemos convenido es que la mitad del auditorio sale por esta puerta, la mitad del auditorio por esta puerta y tranquilamente nos vemos después. La otra es que hoy es la elección de representantes del Consejo Interno, entonces este, no se olviden de votar, es muy importante que participen. Y la otra es que el jueves de esta semana, jueves 19 de mayo, tenemos eh, otro seminario extraordinario que es el doctor César Barrios Amoros, que es un investigador, uh, bueno, es catalán, pero trabaja en Costa Rica. Y nos viene a platicar sobre sus investigaciones que ha hecho acerca de la petofauna de los tepuyes, que es esta zona que está entre Venezuela y... Bueno, prácticamente Venezuela, pero cerca de Brasil, ¿no? Y eso es el jueves a 19 a las 11, entonces, este... ¿Me equivoqué, Alejandro? Colombia también. Colombia también, ¿no? Y... Bueno, tenemos este, el día de hoy el gusto de tener al doctor Michael uh, Ward, que es... Uh, Profesor asociado del Departamento, Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences and Avian Ecologist at Illinois Natural History Survey. Entonces, eh, nos va a platicar, ahí está el título de, de su plática. El doctor Michael este, eh, obtuvo la licenciatura en Florida State University en 1995 y eh, maestría en el 2000 en la University of Illinois. Y el doctorado, el PhD, lo obtuvo en el 2004 también en la Universidad de Illinois. Uh, él ha publicado una buena cantidad de artículos, la mayoría uh, relacionados con aves, biología de aves, y bueno, que es de lo que nos tiene que platicar el día de hoy. Y el director, voy eh, a decir un par de palabras. ¿Qué tal? Buenos días. Eh, bueno, nada más para agregar que el doctor Ward tiene como parte de una delegación oficial de académicos de la Universidad de Illinois, eh, en donde se está eh, pues estableciendo una colaboración muy importante entre esa universidad y la, y la UNAM. Eh, yo ya tuve una conversación muy productiva con, con el doctor Ward en la mañana y este, pues la idea es que fomentemos colaboraciones no solamente de proyectos, sino que eh, nuestros estudiantes de eh, tanto licenciatura como de posgrados eh, puedan involucrarse más en los proyectos del Dr. Ward en el sentido de hacer visitas académicas a, a, a la Universidad de Illinois eh, o hacer trabajo de campo con él eh, pues en un lugar terriblemente feo como es el Caribe mexicano. Entonces, este, nada más de saber la ubicación de los sitios de trabajo del doctor Ward, este, yo ya me voy a volver ornitólogo y estudiante además. Este, entonces, bueno, es algo eh, oficial la visita del, del doctor Ward y les agradezco que hayan eh, venido también a un segundo sem seminario consecutivo el día de hoy y bueno, para mí es un placer que esté el doctor Michael Ward aquí en México. Bienvenido, Michael. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed coming here. Today I'll be giving this talk in English. Hopefully I can come back sometime in the future and I'll, my Spanish will be better. I can give it in Spanish. But for today it'll be in English. Um, and it, again, thanks for the hospitality. I've had great visits with many of you today and I look forward to collaborations in the future. And today I, I really feel um, honored to be able to present some of the research we've been doing on migratory birds in Mexico. So just a little bit of a primer overview of what my lab does. So we study uh, we try to understand the behavior and the ecology of birds in order to do conservation of these birds. So if you look at birds in general, the ones that are declining are migratory. So we need to understand whether the grassland, wetland, forest species, why they are declining. So are they picking bad places to stop over? So like in Cancun, we do research there, and a bird stops over at an all-inclusive hotel in, in Riviera Maya, that's a bad spot to stop. 
And so trying to understand why they chose that and where else we, could we get them to go to. Um, we also have some issues with frogs I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, the only reason we do work with frogs is because I can manipulate them. I can do experiments a lot easier on frogs than I can on birds. But I won't talk about that today. So we have a shared resource here. There's a tri-national committee for partners with flight um, that Canada, U.S., and Mexico. So just, you know, around here, the last couple days I've been in Mexico City, some of the birds we see here today are going to be migrating north to, to Illinois or the United States. And in the United States, we have a, lots of laws to try to protect migratory birds. But we can do all we want to do in Illinois, but if the wood thrushes are dying in Katanaru, then we need to be re doing research there. So we finally convinced the government in the United States to try to invest more and work closer with um, people in Mexico. And that's why it's great to be here, because it's, you know, obviously it's a shared resource. It's your resource, it's, it's our resource. And um, I really look forward to actually working with students and trying to get the students um, to our area. So we're trying to understand what's limiting the bird's ability to migrate. Partisan flight came up with this figure. So in Illinois, so I'm right here in the middle of Illinois, the birds in winter, this is their distribution. So again, what I do, so I work with our natural resources people, NGOs in Illinois, almost every week, about trying to do conservation. But if it's all going bad in Veracruz or Campeche, we need to be working there as well. And this, these are some of the birds that are the, I don't know, this is curlew, thrush, I'm going to use common names. I know in Mexico you all use uh, uh, scientific names. My, uh, one of my first PhD students was from Cuernavaca, and so he drove me crazy because he would never use common names. So I told him he no, you can't use Latin names anymore. So I've got him, I've got him not, not using common names. And the indigo bunny is another one here. So we know, we have lots of research out there. So we know birds like this, this is Swainson thrush. They breed up in Canada, migrate through you know, the central part, and then go down to parts of Mexico, but mostly in South America. So we know on the breeding grounds, they survive very well. So 95% chance they'll live through the breeding season. And then research in South America has shown there's a 90% chance they'll survive in the winter. The question is, what is going in between? We know overall that a given thrush or given bird has a 60% chance of dying in a given year. And so it makes sense that a lot of the mortality we're seeing is going through here. And so we need to understand what's limiting these birds. So I'm kind of jumping into some things off the bat. We're going to talk about a project that we got going maybe eight years ago. It was funded by National Science Foundation, National Geographic, and we had lots of great partners, including the Kanam Sasal, um, to get this going in Katanaru in Yucatan. And it's just, uh, it's not just me. So I'm going to probably say me or I a lot, but we had lots of great uh, help. Jill Zeppi, who did her PhD in Yucatan, uh, the UC Riverside, um, Antonio Salsmarillo, he is my student um, from Cuernavaca. A couple other people from Illinois, USGS, Southern Mississippi, Delaware, USGS. So we have lots of different uh, people helping us in this project. So the big question is, are birds able to fly across this open area and do they arrive in Yucatan? So we use what's called automated radio telemetry. So you guys probably, some of you might know about this. You put a transmitter on a bird and it goes beep beep, beep, and you have an antenna, and you walk around the receiver, and you can say, oh, the bird's over there. I mean, people do it with mammals as well. It's over here. So engineers on our campus have taken that technology and moved it to automated systems. So I don't, we don't need the student out in the field tracking these birds, because students, you know, we can make you work eight hours a day, but we can't make you work 24 hours a day, right? So we have the automated system out there to see what's going on. In the, this is Alabama. In Alabama, we had these towers. We ban birds right here. We look at how much fat they have. This is the little transmitter. So move the kingdom. So very, very small. Um, in fact, we did hummingbirds. Ruby throw the hummingbirds. So you know, 0.2 gram transmitter. So very, very small transmitters. Um, we tagged about 244 birds over this time period. We had really good data on Monday to when they get there. And then the part I was mostly involved with was in the Yucatan. Um, so initially we flew down there and we had to find collaborators, we had to find places to set up these towers, uh, which turned out to be great. We had some, some issues, but we got it all worked out. So these towers have antennas pointing, and we essentially create a fence. So if the bird crosses that fence, we know when it got there. And so um, for people that are, this is Isla Cantole, Mobos, Elculio, Salon Bravo, Chichilu, Sasal, across this area, we actually put a tower in the Colesville the last couple of years. So what are we looking at? Do they arrive? 
So when they leave Alabama, do they show up in the Yucatan? If they do, how long does it take them to get across that area? And then when they get here, do they land? So as a lot of you probably know, there's a big moisture gradient across the Yucatan Peninsula. So over by Cancun, it's wet, bigger forest. Over by Merida, it's much more dry, thorny forest. And so this is going to be really important for the birds, as we'll get to in a second. We worked on red-eyed vireos, swainson's rush, and wood thrush. These were nice. They're small birds, but we can put a transmitter on that lasts for about a month. So it uh, works out pretty good. And so this is 1,000 kilometers, which is pretty amazing to think about. These little birds, so these birds weigh as much as a, a U.S. quarter. So there's a coin. So very, very small birds. And so are they able to make it here? And then we have a postdoc, and, and we model, we'll talk about this in a second, we model the, the weather. So as a hurricane's coming up through Cancun, does the hurricane kill all the birds? Or, um, as we found out, actually, the hurricane helps birds, because they get on the very edge of the hurricane, and it, and it forces them around. I'm not going to get into the methods too much, but essentially what we get is this. So it's, um, you have noise and you have signal. So you don't detect the bird. All of a sudden, the bird, you detect it, and you go, and um, you pick it up for a while. This bird must have landed. So once it lands in the tropical forest or wherever it lands, we can't detect the signal anymore. We were also able to determine how high they fly because we have multiple towers to pick them up and based on the curvature of the earth, we can estimate how high they fly, which will become very important here because of the wind development, uh, wind turbines that are being proposed in Salam de Bravo and Cozumel. Uh, this also produces, and I was talking to you directly this morning about this, we get lots of data, millions and millions of lines. And so there's lots of opportunities for students to data mine, to take this data and this not only tells us, this, so this tells us the bird was there, it flew fast, we can actually figure out how fast it flew, when it landed sometimes, sometimes we pick it up, how much activity it was doing, uh, how the wind affected it, there's lots of opportunities to mine these data. So cutting to the chase, what we find is that uh, we got 16% we of the red areas, 31% of the swing rushes, and 28% of the lift rushes, and they fly very fast. So on average it took them 20 hours, roughly, to go 1,000 kilometers. So they're flying between 45 and 50 kilometers per hour. So they're really making it across very fast. The, uh, and we'll talk why these, the birds that we didn't detect, it doesn't mean they die. So uh, we'll talk more about this in a second, what happened to these birds. Um, we know that a lot of red areas, when they get to Yucatan, they stop. They land in the forest. Sometimes they land close enough to our towers that eventually they'll fly back up. So bird, I should mention this before, birds migrate at night in case you guys didn't know this. All these birds migrate at night. And so during the day, they're there, and as soon as the sun goes down, they fly up in the sky and they fly south again. A couple of swings thrush landed. None of the wood thrush ever landed. Uh, this, we know that coastal habitat is particularly important for some of these species, and this will lead to the other story I'm going to talk about. This was work from Jill um, and uh, Rottenberry years ago. So we ended up creating a model using the weather data and our departure and arrival the, the size of the dot determines how fast they're going. And so essentially what it comes down to is there was no wind that could stop the Swainson's rush from making it to the Yucatan. They are very, very well evolved to make this journey. They make it very fast. And sometimes they get lost, but they can realize it and come back down here. Also, you guys might notice around here that birds are in flocks, right? right? There's a bunch of birds together. And so we see in Alabama, when the sun goes down, they all fly out in the sky. So we think it's a flock. They're all flying together. They're not. So they're all making individual decisions the whole time across here. We're also able to model how high they fly. So some of these birds are flying three kilometers high. That's pretty high for a bird. On average, between 500 and 1,000 kilometers or meters high. So survival. This is a uh, prothonotary warbler that washed up on Eastern Kentucky. We know some of them are dying. But the big question is why are they dying? What can we do about this? So I'll take a little bit of time on this slide, it's hard to follow. So we looked at fat scores, so how much fat they have in their belly. And so this is the direction, this is north, south, east, west, the direction the birds left in the Alabama. So one of the really big surprises we found was that the majority of red areas were flying north. This is in the fall, they should be going to South America. And they're going back north. So what are they doing? We see some swing to rushes, fewer with rushes do this. The ones we detect in Yucatan, obviously, are all going south, generally about 166 degrees. They're heading toward Colombia, generally. 
So what's going on with these birds? Well, it turns out the way um, many ornithologists score fat is you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 4 and 5, those are fat birds. They're, you touch them and you feel fat. Down to 0 where they have no fat. Well, if it's a 4 or a 5, it goes to you can and has no problem at all. 3, some of them make it, some of them don't, some of them die. 0, 1, and 2, they don't even try. So they reverse migrate. We're able to determine, so if anyone's been down to Alabama or Mississippi or Florida, and it's the same, you know, in the Utah. Along the coast, it's all developed. So you have hotels, you have condominiums, you have apartments. There's not much habitat there. So what we found is they can't put on fat because there's no habitat there. Um, the deep water horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, that's also contaminated in some of these areas, and the insect populations are way down. So the birds know they can't do it, and they have to, generally they're flying back north two hours, because it takes about two hours to get away from people, to get out into the deep forest to get the fat. The other thing we are interested in is arrival location. So are they making a conscious effort to stop in one area in um, Yucatan Peninsula? We didn't really, there's no statistical differences here. We did seem to notice that a lot of birds are showing up here. One reason we think that might be true is that birds that arrive at night, so Cancun is very, very bright. So when you fly into Cancun at night, it's very, very bright. And birds are attracted to light. And so we think some are landing around Cancun. But we had them over by, you know, uh, Celestoon and Merida throughout the area. So this is actually important now. On Friday, I got a call from the World Bank. So the World Bank is providing some funding for Mexico to develop a wind power in uh, Puesto Salón de Bravo. And so this is very, and, and Cozumel. So this is very important for, they want to build, and you guys have a, I understand you have a um, goal of trying to reduce your, your use of fossil fuels. And so wind power is obviously a great way for renewable energy. But if all the birds are getting chopped up in the blades, that's not a good thing. It uh, turns out that these birds are flying way above where the turbines are. However, we did have some pretty good evidence from Illinois that when you put up turbines, the birds won't stop there because they see, I don't know if you have turbines around here, but there's a flicker. So the sun causes a shadow that goes around in circles, and it's very unnerving. And so the birds won't stop there. So the, we, I talked to this guy from the World Bank for hours, but essentially they're going to try to put wind power through here, but we convinced them to move it back off the coast a little ways. So if the bird was running out of fat, at least they could stop there. Um, so I was afraid that if it was running out of fat, they would try to do something like crazy and die in the ocean. So the data that we collected were obviously important for the uh, development of the Salon Bravo, and then for Coles and Mill. Talking with your director this morning, also an uh, area that I think is of importance con from a conservation perspective is the expansion of hotels primarily and other things in Rivera Maya and Coles and Mill. So we know that these areas aren't Birds show up, it looks pretty good. So birds flying over, they like to see heterogeneity. They like to see open areas with some flowery shrubs. And so if you go to some of these, um, occasionally our flight from Cancun to Chicago gets delayed. And so they put us up in one of these all-inclusive places. And if you walk out in the morning, there's hooded warblers, um, magnolia warblers, there's a bunch of warblers there. And they're trying to feed, because it looks like there should be insects there. But they're not doing a very good job. And then secondly, it creates a great opportunity for education. So Maybe not all, I mean, these hotels have Europeans and Mexicans and whatever, but a lot of the, I think there's an opportunity there to educate the Americans. So, you know, some Americans aren't going to care. So they got their pina coladas and they're fine. But some of them might actually care about the bird that was in my house in Chicago three weeks ago is now here. And so understanding the importance of, and maybe you contribute to that, having ecological tours. So right now they take them out to these fake jungles where they have like macaws and birds that don't even occur in the area, and monkeys. So, you know, monkeys are really hard to find in the Yucatan. But they're giving them a, not a true experience of what nature is. So I hope that in the future they can do a better job of educating the public about the importance of these areas. So, um, there's more with this study. But this is kind of the take up. So the birds get across there very fast. They really, if they have fat, there's nothing stopping them. Um, they, in theory, if you do the physiological models, they can make it all the way from Alabama to Columbia. And we, I met with a Columbia researcher a couple years ago, and she was saying that in Columbia, where they ban birds, they catch 30% uh, of their swings and switches were completely emaciated. So they had zero fat, which would suggest that they're going the whole way, which is pretty amazing for a bird that you know, it's this size. 
So after that, we um, were able to team up. There's a program at Illinois that has team up with uh, Luis Antonio Gonzalez and a uh, grad student, Ivan, um, to look at. So previously, we looked at stopover ecology mainly in Alabama. So we wanted to look at stopover ecology in the Yucatan. So once they get to the Yucatan, can they fatten up? And so we use the analogy of they can stop at a rest area. So I'm sure you have rest areas in Mexico. So you stop there. There might be a candy bar, some candy, uh, and a cocoa light, but not much. Or you go to McDonald's where you get more food, but the food isn't very nutritious, right? So you can survive on McDonald's, but it's not that good for you. Or you can stop over at a five-star restaurant, a top restaurant, and you can spend some time and eat all the food you want. And so we selected two sites, Eladen and Isla Cantoy, across this, what we thought was across this continuum to try to understand if they're able to put on fat or not. So uh, has anyone here been to Eladen? So Eladen is great. Uh, uh, it's uh, amazing for birds. It's a great place to work. The only problem is there's not much power. But the great thing about not having much power there is our automated systems pick up background noise, electromagnetic noise. So like the, on Isla Cantoy, if a cruise ship goes by, we can't detect any birds because the cruise ship is, it has lots of electromagnetic noise. Like in your uh, radio in your car, it doesn't have noise. But in Eladen, it's you know middle of nowhere, so it's, we pick up some long ways away. And they have lots of jaguars. I, I never saw a jaguar, but they tell me there's lots of jaguars. <laughs> and then over to Isla Cantoy. Uh, so it's a national park. It's really managed for tourists. So every day tourists come out there and go snorkeling and kind of lay on the beach, that kind of stuff. But we, the habitat is coastal dune or mangroves. And from our work out there, we didn't think it was producing a lot of insects. So we, wanted, we thought that Ella Den would be the five-star restaurant, and then Katoy would be either a rest area or a McDonald's. So is a habitat you can allow birds to replenish fat and continue their migration. Um, we use automated rate telemetry again, which uh, works out, again, pretty well. We get lots of data, but we can analyze it later. Um, I even did some hand tracking, but I don't really know what happened with that. And then we did some metabolite work. So metabolites are, um, so for me, so in the United States right now we eat, right? So I'm hungry right now, so I have higher levels of certain metabolite that suggest that I'm hungry. After I eat, you have higher levels of, of butte, which suggests that you're processing your food. Well, we can do the exact same thing with birds. We take the blood samples and we, then we look at, are they fasting, are they starving, or are they eating lots of food? Um, the problem with this, um, which I think is another opportunity to collaborate with you guys, is we cannot import blood into the United States because of fear of avian influenza for chickens, for poultry. And so we ended up having to, I brought my postdoc down to Merida. He didn't complain too much. And then he worked at Unam Sasal at their laboratory to do the metabolite work. Um, this was, right here is a, the other thing we've done, NSF requires us to do documentaries. So Mauricio, who lives in Playa del Carmen, we hired him to create little documentaries of how to catch birds, where the birds are at, um, and so it's been great. And then these are produced for NSF, National Science Foundation, and they put them on Facebook and that kind of stuff. But so he hasn't got it done yet, but I'm hoping this will be a good educational tool. Okay, so at Isla Cantoy, this is the number of birds that went in different directions. We're still analyzing some of this data. But on Isla Cantoy, you see a third of all the birds don't go south. They go to the mainland. A bunch of them head toward East Luna Harris in Cancun, and then a few of them go southeast. Uh, a couple of these go west, go this direction, but that's kind of a, a bad decision. And the birds that went this way, that's a really bad decision, right? So um, hopefully they change their direction or they're going to they're gonna die. Here's Eladen. So Eladen is, is different. So about 40% of the birds are heading in this direction. Some are going south. Others are going west again, which is a bit um, confusing. It could be that they were wanting to go toward Veracruz, um, Campeche, and go down that way. So there, there, there's a couple different ways they could go. If you look at it on a very large scale, here's Katoya, they want to go here. So they want to go in this direction. So they don't really want to go south. But what we're finding at Isla Katoya is they had so little fat, and they had such a limited ability to add fat, that a bunch of them just went straight to the mainland. And because they figured the mainland they could find some good habitat. Some of them kind of compromised, went in between, and would follow the coast. But of course, if you follow the coast, at some point, I mean, you could follow the coast all the way down here, but it's a much faster way to, to go across the earth. The other thing I should mention is that 
these birds, it's an area uh, I'd like to do research on in Mexico, is on their winter ecology. So a lot of birds we're finding have territories. So you know, right now that robin outside is singing because it has a territory and you know, it's going to breed. But it turns out in winter, they also have territories. And the first ones that get back get the best territory. So there's a real good incentive for these birds to get down to Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, Peru, very, very quickly. And if you are messing around in Yucatan, you got, by the time you get down here, you won't get the best territory. The, uh, and the birds in El Aden were going in this direction, which would suggest that they're going to go a straight route. So this is farther. This is like 2,000 kilometers. But they could do it if they had lots of fat. So we're still analyzing the data. We got data last year. Um, we know that the stopover duration in El Aden is much longer. We had some birds, and again, I think this is analogous to the five-star restaurant that showed up in El Aden. They don't winter there. They winter in South America and spent 20 days. So if it's a good spot, why be in such a hurry, right? Especially for red-eyed vireos, because they aren't territorial in South America. The only, only thrushes are territorial in South America. At Kutoy, we would catch birds in the morning. Some are not natives. We had to stop by 10 o'clock in the morning. And literally that night, when the sun went down, almost all of them left. The only ones that didn't leave were ones that were really, really fat and were going to hang out a couple days, or ones that were so skinny that they probably even couldn't make it across the three or four kilometers to the mainland. Habitat use, we're working on that right now. The uh, habitat use patterns suggest that mangroves are very important, which has, again, important conservation implications. Obviously, mangroves are important for fish and other in, um, taxa. But, as some of you probably know, the hotels down there don't like mangroves. And it's my understanding that Mexican law says if mangroves start growing up, they can't cut them down. But we see quite a bit where they get rid of them because they want to have that white sand beach. Well, there's a couple species, northern water thrush, contrary warbler. That's the only habitat they're using is those mangroves. Uh, activity patterns. So we did a bunch of work in the United States on how much work they got to put in to find the food. So it turns out if you're in a really good spot, you can go find, it's like a, you go to a smorgasbord, you go eat for a little while, and you go lay around and take a siesta, just take it easy. If you're in an area that has no food, you're constantly moving around trying to find that food. And so it's a, a double-edged sword. So you can't find the food, so you use more energy and more the little fat you have to go find more. And so it's, it's a bad, vicious circle. And I mentioned that already before, but the metabolite data we got are some of the most stressed birds ever recorded. Actually, the most stressed ever recorded in literature. So this is a relatively new approach in birds. And going through the literature, we're order of magnitude higher levels, which really suggests these birds are crossing the Gulf and just running out of fuel. Uh, a colleague of mine at Max Planck in Germany has shown that when they run out of fat, they actually start metabolizing their liver uh, and organs in order to make it to there. So obviously, it's a better choice than, than falling into the ocean. Um, and we know, I should have mentioned this before, we also know from our friends, the ichthyologists, that a lot of birds do fall in there. There was a study on oil rigs um, in the Gulf catching tiger sharks and looking at their stomach contents, and the number one stomach contents of tiger sharks were birds. And these weren't pelagic birds, seabirds. These were thrushes and thrashers and sparrows. And so what's happening is they're flying across the Gulf, they're dying, falling in there, and then these tiger sharks are, are eating them all up. So we know, we know that a lot of birds do, do are dying. So uh, how I see for my own research program advancing is trying to understand the quality of wintering and migratory habitat. Uh, again, these are our shared resources, and so we, you know, in my opinion, have an ob obligation to try to do conservation. And then, at least in the United States, there's legal reasons why. There's the Neotropical Bird Act, which is one of our oldest conservation laws in the United States that uh, protects these birds. And it's, you know, a lot of my colleagues, so the University of Illinois, we have quite a few bird people, eight or nine, and they always go to exotic places. So they're going to you know, Pipeline Road in Panama, or they're going to uh, Manu in Peru, which is great. We need to know what's going on in natural habitats, but we also need to know what's going on in urban agricultural areas. Agriculture is increasing, so in the, in the Yucatan, they have these little milpas, which look like they're very good for birds, but then you have the more industrial farms, which aren't good. And so, I mean, we got to feed people, but at the same time, we need to think about sustainable intensification, so sustaining the habitat. Um, behaviors on the, on the breeding grounds, public dynamics. So that's what I really do in Illinois, is we do stuff where we, uh, at night, we work with the Army. So it turns out the U.S. Army is one of the top 
organizations for conservation for birds in the United States by far because they're mandated underneath the Endangered Species Act to protect these birds. And so what we figured out how to do is you play vocalizations at night when the birds are flying over and you can attract them to areas where they're not going to blow stuff up, right? So they got tanks and they shoot the tank in there and there's a big explosion and then birds die. And so what we have shown is we can, on a lot of different bases, we can manipulate where the birds go to. Um, and we can understand why they make poor choices. And so the same is true in Mexico and, and, and um, Cancun, that, you know, why do you choose not to go to El Aden and you choose to go to the Riviera Maya and not do a very good job? So if you start understanding why they behave the way they do, you might be able to do conservation that mitigates that. Um, using automated telemetry to understand home ranges. Initially, we had lots of trouble importing antennas into, um, into Mexico, um, and we were not allowed to import antennas into Cuba. But we now have it all figured out. So if you get, wherever we go, if they have a Home Depot, um, we can make it by scratch. And so we have the automated system all figured out, and it'd be interesting to not only get migratory birds, but also have the ability to look at home ranges. So how are they moving around? We know water thrushes. They use the mangroves. So if you go to the hotel zone in Cancun, there's a, there's a big mangrove right there that's just full of water thrushes. And I know there's some discussion about filling some of that in. And we can understand how big a territory is. So if they did want to fill some in, we would know what impact we have on birds. So in general, understand what's limiting the populations. This is an indigo bunny. I know they occur in winter around here. They're already back in Illinois. And they're a bird that's Declining, but not very much. So one of the problems we have in bird conservation is we wait until there's two left, and then we try to do conservation. So that's not a very good approach, right? So we need to understand bird run. It's not, it's not a linear decline. So when things are declining, they, don't, they hit a tipping point, and then they drop off. And so we need to, for them to go bunny, understand what is causing their population to decline. Is it cornfields in, in Illinois? Is it you know, forests here in uh, Mexico? So and one last thing I want to mention here is I think in talking with you guys this morning is a great opportunity for students to come up to Illinois. So we have um, so Illinois is kind of similar to the now in that we have very it's very research oriented. We have lots of students, like forty five thousand students. But for myself, I teach one course a semester, and my main job is really research. And so we have lots of great um, resources for students coming in, um, and you know it's a you're kind of in the middle of nowhere, but Chicago's not very far away. Uh, uh, Antonio's there, so Antonio's from Cuernavaca, and uh, he can kind of show you the ropes. Um, but, uh, so I think there's a great opportunity there, and as we proceed with our work in Catan Rio and Yucatan, um, I would really like to take advantage of you guys to do some of the work down there. I, mean, I have students in the United States that want to come down here, but we have so many problems in the United States, and they want jobs in the United States, that if you're engaged in conservation in Mexico, that's the way to do it. So I know it went pretty fast. Here I am on Isla Cantoli carrying a, a, the antenna through the, uh, through the tourists. This is pretty funny because Simranat uh, forgot to take us out there this day. So we caught a ride with the tourist boat. But then the tourist boat didn't wait for me to put the tower up and left us out there. So luckily there were some researchers studying uh, octopus bubble and they gave us some food and water or we were, lost. We were left out there the whole day. Right. Anyway, well thanks and let me, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Start going in bad places. 
Um, we do know that a lot of the ones that make bad decisions are first year birds. So that they were just born in Canada, they've never flown across the Gulf, and they don't know what to do. And so they cue in on adults. So a lot of these, like for us, they kind of look the same, adults and juveniles. But if you look closely, you can tell them apart. And there's data suggesting that birds know an older bird or a younger bird. And if the older birds all go to a certain area, it's, it's kind of like humans, right? So the kids follow the parents around. So the, the adults go to a certain area, the kids follow them. And so I think that um, that's really important. One thing we have seen in a few years is that um, one year, Several hurricanes came through there, and the young birds made some poor decisions. So they should have left and gone around the hurricane. They stayed in Alabama. The hurricane hit there, and a lot of them died. But also remember that if all the young birds live every year, in 10 years, the mass of birds would be greater than the whole mass of the world, because they produce a lot of young, right? So it's okay for birds to die. We just have to keep them at a certain level so they keep going. But that's a great question, because we want to actually do some experiments where we um, have fat birds and lean birds at LN, and we make them go get lean, and then we see which way to go. And uh, can I make a and one comment that we discussed earlier that I want to share with my colleagues is that um, for these migratory phenomena of animals, um, we need to, if we want to make wise conservation actions or strategies, we have to look at the whole picture, not only conserve that species or a set of populations in one area, and because that will not ensure that the species will have a sound conservation strategy to conserve the whole uh, biological. And I was very happy to get to appear to have a very strong geographic information system component to the institute. Because I think there's opportunities. So we, we start figuring out how birds select habitats and why they go to certain places. Then we can go to the government. You guys can go to the Mexican government and say, if you look at the layers, this is a critical area, this is a critical area. But we're not going to be able to save it all. We know that. But we've got to decide what we're going to sacrifice and what we're going to you know, preserve. So, yes? Um, the choice of species are like different species that are like the most common? Oh, that's a good question. So they were common, relatively common. Uh, there was a few species that were rare, but the, um, we didn't catch enough sample size to, to, to work with them. And the Yucatan, we wanted to work with some other rare migratory species, like Swainson's warbler, Canada warbler, and um, Golden Wing warbler. But uh, some are not going to give us the permits, because they were worried about uh, So that's another reason to work with you guys. Um, our relationship with permitting is not always good. So it's just, I don't know if you have the same problems, it takes forever, so. And is a philopathy, philopathy in general? Yes. That is breeding and then... So it is. So the more, we, we knew already in the breeding that almost every bird is highly philopathic. Even the, the young birds don't come back to the exact same site, but they're in the same area. Now we know, we need to know a lot more, that in winter, like wood thrushes, um, at the Smithsonian Institute, Mara did some work, where they're coming back to the exact same spot every year, which makes sense, right? So if you live, if you're hanging out in Belize and you have a good winter, you should come back to the next winter. There's no reason to risk going to Oaxaca or something like that. You go back to where you know it's going to be good. And so that's actually a really important thing for conservation. So if we know they come back, then if we protect certain areas, you can really bolster the population quickly because they show file patchery. Yes? How long do these birds live? How many times they Oh, how long they live? Yeah. So they're making that trip both spring and fall, and on our data suggests they probably live on average for six or seven years. So, but it's not a continuous. So some birds live probably 12 to 13, and some live one or two. Some of the birds just make bad decisions, just like humans, right? So they make bad decisions and they, they die quickly. Also, on the average, it's five to six, but if they make it through that first couple years, they're probably living 10 to 12. And we like to add more, the hummingbird, I didn't talk about the hummingbird data in here. Hummingbirds always, I call it chicken out. They are, they're, they're not very uh, strong. They always go around the Gulf, and they don't go through Cuba. Um, so we've been doing work in Cuba. Cuba, well, as you might know, U.S. and Cuba don't have a very good relationship. And so it's very hard for me to work in Cuba. And if I ask them to bring in communication, telemetry stuff, it's very, very bad. So, uh, 
So we haven't been able to do that work in there. But we know hummingbirds will go through Cuba, and we know that they're all going around through Tamaulipas, Veracruz, and coming all the way around to Yucatan, which is kind of weird because you think they try to fly across, but they don't. And so we, uh, a lot of different birds probably do different, have different strategies. Uh, we know in our work from Cuba that, so I, I'm really worried about Cuba because when it opens up for the U.S., they're going to destroy it, right? So they're going to put hotels everywhere. It's going to probably be pretty bad. And in Cuba, where we did our work, there was lots of migratory birds that we don't actually get in Yucatan. I mean, it's not very far, but a lot of them are choosing Yucatan. Yeah, it was sparked by your question as well. Like, you know, if, I mean, I, 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 I got to realize this when I was living in the U.S. that the straight line to Colombia from the U.S. is not Mexico. No. That's, that's shown in the maps, right? Right. Actually, it's across the Caribbean. So, so the question is, why not do island hopping, right? So, so especially for these birds, that is, I mean, that is a huge distance. Right. So that's a great question. Um, we've been in Jamaica and Dominica. Uh, I think that, and there's good work in Jamaica, that the habitats there, even pristine habitats, aren't as good as big mainland habitats. So they're uh, the wet season and the dry season. So there are some birds, like black and blue warblers and gray cheek thrush that do it. But I think it's safer to jump down along the edge because some of these islands, El Nino and La Nina, they don't have very good food. The, the guy at Smithsonian, uh, Pete Mara, <laughs> has done great work in Jamaica showing on El Nino years, it's very bad to go to Jamaica because you cannot find the food you need and they don't make it back to where they breed. But, uh, but that's a good question. I think Dominica, which is way out in the Western Antilles, there's hardly any migrants. I think it's just a risk factor. It's just too risky. And you're better off, like you said, going to Colombia, but if, you, if you're chicken out. So if you're going and all of a sudden the hurricanes come in or there's bad weather, then you can go to Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and at least you can live. So. And, yes. and the second question is about, um, so, Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's about uh, so the talking and the fucking part, right? So these birds don't talk. Uh -huh. And to me, it's not surprising because, you know, it's like, it's a, it's, it's a thousand kilometers, right? So, like, for us, if we are going to run a marathon, yeah. we better do it in groups so we can motivate each other. I mean, uh, I cannot even motivate myself to run down to the bedroom right. house. Right? right, right. So why, what is the advantage of doing it by themselves no. instead of flocking? Yeah, that was the most interesting result to me. Because think about a young bird. So you were born in Canada, you haven't ever crossed and all of a sudden you show up and as far as you can see, and then why don't you follow the adults? And so we thought, and lots of the literature thought that was going to be the case, but we have birds that fly up in the sky at the exact same time, I mean, within a second. They're right together, and then one will show up two hours later, or two hours, no, 22 hours later in Merida, and another one 18 hours later in Cancun. And I think it's because once, there's a lot of new research on the, they call it the aeroscape, the, how the winds, so the winds across the ocean and the winds 3,000 meters high aren't always the same. And so depending on what altitude you select, you might get pushed in different directions. But that's a, I, mean, I was very surprised about the result as well. Um, we just had a paper come out in um, Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, and uh, the reviewers, that's the main, like, how could this be true? And I'm like, I don't know, but every line of evidence shows they're not doing it. I mean, we have really, really strong evidence. They leave at the exact same time, and they never get it. We have one pair out of all the birds. One pair got to um, Isla Cantoya at Bluff within like 10 minutes of each other. But other than that, everybody was different. So, that's a good question. Yes? Uh, which is the sense of returning to, to Canada in the winter? If they have food and they have uh -huh. the temperature and right. everything in the Caribbean? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So ornithologists have been thinking about that for years, right? Um, so the, the going hypothesis is that in, um, we have good work in Panama and people in Costa Rica, so that nest predation is much, much higher. So if you look at the likelihood of a wood thrush producing young, it's like 60%. You look at the birds in, so the long-term study in Pipeline Road in Panama, and look, there's like 10% chance they're going to produce. And so these birds risk going to Illinois because also our bugs, our insects, don't have any secondary compounds, so they can eat all they want. And a lot of insects around here are, aren't very good for nutritional wise. Um, the other thing I think people don't realize so migration just came to the Champagne. So we have orchard orioles and kingbirds showing up, and we think of this as our species. But they show up, the day they show up, they build a nest, the day they're young or old enough to fly, they come back to Mexico and Panama. So we think of them as our birds, but they're spending as little amount of time in the temperate area as they can. So that, that's the reason we think. And so if you look at all, the, from a phylogenetic point of view, systematic point of view, if you look at the birds, the evolution of it, the birds evolved here, and then a few of them started doing the migration. And then your sister species are, are sitting down there in Mexico and they don't migrate. 
Yeah, I have a question. Um, sure. I, I told you for that we work with parasites. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you, if you ever look at the parasites. Yeah, we have. So we caught birds um, in the spring. We haven't published it yet. In the spring in Alabama, they were carrying ticks that are only known from Central America. And so they're moving these ticks around. I did my postdoc on West Nile virus, and we know that these birds are moving West Nile virus around. The reason it doesn't become more of a problem in Yucatan is because the mosquito, the QX mosquito species aren't the right kind of mosquitoes. Uh, but the U.S. government's very worried that avian influenza, all of these migratory birds are going to move around pathogens. My take is that when birds get avian influenza, they're very sick. They can't fly a thousand kilometers. And the main reason we move around avian influenza and the other diseases is illegal trafficking of chickens and poultry. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is, we catch the birds and we find ticks on them and stuff, and, but we don't have a lot of experts to actually look at that stuff. So uh, if you have the expertise, we can get... Yeah, there's some people here working. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah that, that, we could get ticks for you. So uh, we catch lots of birds. So uh, we hired a, a guy from Veracruz last year, he's looking toy. He caught 3,000 birds. Um, lots and lots of birds. And lots of birds you would never expect. So like sparrows, white crowned sparrows, they don't occur in Mexico. But what must have happened is they overshot Florida and they got stuck out over the Gulf and they landed at East Lake So I've been trying to get him to publish it, but uh, he's not very good at publishing. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.